seven keys to church growth. And you can follow along in your Bible, but I, but I am going to show uh, all the verses that I'm reading uh, have on the screen. Okay. Um, but it's in Acts chapter 16. There'll be a couple of verses from Acts chapter 15. But this is a, a basic message. Um, not as complicated as Zechariah, so you should be a little easier to follow. Um, but uh, seven keys to church growth. I was reading through this book of uh, Acts and uh, looking at this, and there's, there's seven. I actually had eight, but I decided to cut it down to seven. Uh, seven principles, seven uh, things we can do to grow spiritually ourselves, but more so, seven things we can do to help others to grow. Okay? Uh, seven things we can do to help others come to Christ, and especially for help others to grow in their faith. So I was trying to think of who, who's a growing Christian, and I thought of uh, Gabriel and Alyssa. I thought, so I decided to put their picture up there first. And um, so we, we think of uh, the church, seven keys to church growth. The church is, is people. The church is individuals. And we want individuals to grow spiritually, to go strong, right? And so uh, a little scary picture, but this is our, our good friends, uh, Gabriel and Alyssa. And so the goal of this uh, is helping girls and guys to grow strong in their faith. Seven things we can do to help your friends, your neighbors, your family, anybody who's maybe a, a new Christian or a struggling Christian, someone you haven't seen in a while, seven things you can do. And it's right from here in, uh, in Acts chapter 16. So individuals, we want to grow, but also we want the local church to grow, right? Seven things we can do to help the local church to grow. It's the same principles. It starts with individuals, but it makes the church grow. I don't know who put these bushes in front of the chapel here, Robert. Did you just plant those this week? Okay. Okay. Here's an old picture. Okay. So individuals growing. We want the local church growing. And we want the gospel to spread to the world, right? Right? Seven continents. I won't give a quiz who can name all seven continents, but if you look real fast, there they are. So today we're going to take a look at the gospel going from one continent to the other. Can you guess which continent from which, which to which? Do I have it backwards? Oh, no. I got it. So the gospel goes from, where's my little clicker here? The gospel goes from here, which is Asia, which is the Middle East. It's going from up right around here, from Antioch in Jerusalem, and above it in Syria is Antioch, and then it goes into Turkey, which is still part of Asia, and then it goes into Europe. So this is a story about the gospel going into Europe, okay? And we're going to see that the gospel goes into Europe with Paul in the first century, and long around the fourth century, a guy named Patrick finally gets it all the way over here, Ireland. <laughs> So that's that's our message for today. So <clears throat> let's take a look at this. So seven keys to church growth, Max 16. So what are they? Okay, seven things. First of all, follow-up produces growth. Family focus produces growth. Consistent spirit-led evangelism produces growth. Dedicated, insistent hospitality produces growth. Praying and singing through life's trials produces growth. Explaining the pure, simple gospel produces growth, and baptizing and bringing it to fellowship produces growth. Seven things we see right here in Acts 16. So here we are. We have Paul and Silas. Um, well, actually, this is this is the first missionary journey. Paul was with uh, Barnabas, of course, the first time around, and they left here from Antioch, and they went out, and they visited these cities in, uh, in Turkey, this is all modern, what is now modern day Turkey. But they came to these towns, Perga and another Antioch and Iconium and Lystra and Derby, And then they headed back, visited them again and came back and visited there to the, where they started in Antioch. <clears throat> and so let's read some of the verses about this. So <clears throat> follow up produces growth. In Acts 15, 36, after this first journey, uh, Paul says to Barnabas, let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. And so 
they decide to split up. The Lord had that uh, purpose, no doubt. And in Acts 15, 41, uh, Paul actually goes out with a, a new companion, Silas. And we read that, speaking of Paul here, it says, and he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. So this is the second journey now. They go, they go out from Antioch again, and they go through, through Syria here and Cilicia, and they're strengthening the churches. And they come to Derby and Lystra and Iconium. And as they wanted to, they, they visit again these, these, uh, these churches. Well, <clears throat> the summary of it all, Acts 16, 5, it says, So the churches were strengthened, made firm in the faith, and increased in number daily. So their follow-up produced growth. It, it's declared right here. The they wanted to go back and visit, see how they're doing, and strengthen them. And the end result of it is, because of their follow-up, their, their churches were strengthened. They were made firm in the faith, and they increased in number daily. And so um, I've shared my testimony here uh, a number of times, how a man led me to Christ, and they brought me up to camp right away. And uh, while I was at camp, I met, I met a young lady there, and um, I said, you know, I'm not too clear on the gospel. I, I made a profession of faith. I'm not too clear on it. And so she took me aside, and she said, uh, just take John 3.16 and put your name in it. So I did that, and I thought about it. For God so loved Michael that he gave his only begotten son, that if Michael believes in him, Michael shall not perish, but everlasting life. And so she, she did that. And then uh, later on, uh, she followed up with me. She, she wrote to me, and she shared this verse at the bottom here. I still remember it. Philippians 1, 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. And so two things here. This is um, in Acts 16. This is Paul visiting Philippi. And what does Paul do after he visits them? He writes to them. And this is, I know Brother Mark Swain just gave you a, some teaching on Philippians, so I thought maybe the background would be good to cover in Acts 16. But so Paul writes to the Philippians. He follows up with them. And so people followed up with me when I was a new Christian. Took me to different uh, churches, to different concerts, to different conferences, uh, met, with, met with me, uh, his brother would say, come in my house and we'll watch Billy Graham on TV. <laughs> and uh, so I was so glad I was followed up with. And so that's, it really does produce growth. So what we want to do is we go through these seven principles, just think to yourself, how can I put this principle into practice? Is there someone I can follow up with? I, I can think of people that have been here in the past that are not here and I don't want to name their names, but you, you think about it. And perhaps you could give them a call or write to them. It's so easy now with uh, text. Um, I was texting this morning with uh, Colleen Carabello. And, uh, you know, a little follow-up. And so there's, there's people that need that touch. Think, think of somebody, some sisters, some, some brothers, that just need a little follow-up. And God can, can use you. So follow-up really does produce growth. Uh, the churches were strengthened. And so they, they continue on. They, they take their trip. They get to um, along here to Lystra, Derby, Lystra, and Iconium. And they, they pause there. And Acts 16, verse 1 and 2, we read, Then he, Paul, came to Derby and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed, but his father was Greek. He, Timothy, was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium. So here's a story about uh, family uh, influence, family influence. We read in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 1, verse 5, Paul writing to Timothy later. He says, when I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first, and your grandmother Lois, and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. And so it's possible that 
they first heard the gospel from Paul on his first trip through, but, but we're not told that. But we are told is that Timothy's mother and grandmother were Christians. They, they had a genuine faith. And uh, Paul uh, reminds Timothy of their faith. It dwelt first in his grandmother and his mother. So family focus in building the church is, is so important. Um, I'm so glad when I was a little boy, I didn't understand a whole lot, but I remember at nighttime, my mother tucked me in and she'd have me recite the Lord's Prayer. And, um, you know, that's, that's just a little seat put in there, but family focus, you know, if, if, um, if we see fruit in other people, it's, it's great. If, if our own children don't know the Lord and growth in the Lord, uh, it really, really hurts. So family focus is so important. Don't lose your focus on your family. Proverbs 22.1 says, A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches, loving favor or reputation rather than silver and gold. Timothy, it says, he was well spoken of by the brethren. He had, a, he had a good name. And so uh, that's what we want for our kids. We want them to have a good name as far as, as the things of the Lord is concerned. Not, not so much the great riches. They should learn to take care of themselves and earn a living. But the main thing is they have a good name. So family focus produces growth. And we've seen that. Of course, lots of times it's families, you know, extended families that, that make the local church grow. And so... <clears throat> They, they continued on their journey. Now, as they continued on, um, Paul and Silas now, they, they leave uh, with Timothy. They bring him along, and they go along here, and they want, to, they, go, they want to go into Asia, but the Holy Spirit tells them, oh, no, don't do that. Keep going. So they go around. They want to go up in Bithynia, and the Holy Spirit says, no, no, keep going. And they finally, they, they get all over here, and they're like, okay, now what do we do? We're like, there's water now. <laughs> So, so um, we read in the verses as we continue in Acts 16, verses 6 through 12. And notice, uh, I put in green, the word go, okay? Uh, they've gone, they're going, they're going, and, and they're bringing the ghost spell, the gospel. Right? And so the point here is consistent, spirit-led evangelism produces growth. I do believe it needs to be consistent. Now, we read now, when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, uh, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. So they've, they've gone through, well, you saw it already. <laughs> so passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. Now, after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. So they're spirit-led. They're, they're, they're going, and as they're going, the Lord leads them. Verse 11, Therefore, sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, and the next day came to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is the foremost city of that part of Macedonia, a Roman colony. And we were staying in that city for some days. And so they... They continue on and show the, the journey here. Okay, so they go on, they, they stop at these, these islands here, and they make their way to Philippia. Now, this is uh, modern-day Greece in the, the area of Macedonia within Greece. Um, so, yeah, so this is uh, Asia ends here. This is, this is uh, Turkey. And there's a little bit of water here, and this is where you go from Asia into, into um, Europe. Europe begins here. So this is the gospel for the first time reaching into Europe. So that's, this was what God led them to do. <clears throat> so they get to Europe and to uh, this town of Philippi. And in Acts 16, verse 13 to 15, we read, and on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside, where prayer was customarily made. And we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. So there's a place, it's not in a building. Apparently, there's too small, perhaps even to have a, uh, 
a synagogue in this town. You have to have, set, I think, 10 men to have a synagogue, according to Jewish uh, tradition. But these these women, apparently Jewish ladies, and this, this one woman who is what you might call a proselyte, she's a, a Gentile, but she's among these other women seeking the Lord. And so these ladies are here for prayer. So much can start at a, at a sister's prayer meeting. We used to have sister's prayer meetings here. I'm so glad you have Friday nights, you have Bible study and some prayer time. Uh, keep going with the sister's prayer meeting. So here, here's a sister's prayer meeting. Remember Paul gets this vision, a man coming to him. Maybe maybe that may just looked like a man. Maybe it was actually a woman. <laughs> no, but um, he gets there and, and it's, it's this, these sisters are there. And verse 14, now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple. She's a, a big businesswoman. She sells dyes and she sells fabrics. And she's actually from uh, over in Turkey there in Thyatira. But she had moved her business over to Philippi. And it says she was a woman who worshiped God. So she's already seeking the Lord, right? And she hears Paul and Silas, what they're saying, and it says the Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. So we don't know where God is already moving and working in somebody. They're, they're seeking the Lord, and along comes the gospel, and they, they say, that is what I've been looking for. And so this was Lydia, verse 15. And when she and her household were baptized, we don't know who, who is in her household. We're not told. Uh, could it have been a husband, uh, children? Extended family, maybe some of her employees. Uh, she's a businesswoman. When she and her household were baptized, she begged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she asked us kindly. No, she persuaded us. <laughs> she, she begged us. She says, Come to my house. I want you to stay there, and, and, and I want to have more time with you, and I want to provide for you. So the heading for this is dedicated, insistent hospitality produces growth. There's some people here that I get my arm twisted every time I come here to come to dinner, go to lunch, you know, and that's, that's so beautiful. I think hospitality can extend beyond a meal, okay? It can even extend beyond going to your house. It can just be, I want to get together with you. I want to, I want to call you on the phone. I want to show interest in you. Uh, the first time we came to this chapel, we had been married about eight months, Rita and I, and uh, that we came to morning service and the evening service. Uh, a uh, we had mentioned in the morning some interesting camps. When we came to the evening service, and a brother had a camp brochure and a map all charted out for us how to get to this this Christian camp, Lyman Gordon. Anyway, but it's this uh, interest in people. And hospitality in the home is, is probably one of the best ways to do this, but there's many ways to show this kind of interest in people. And so she begged them, and you know what? Her home actually, it seems, ended up to be the, the beginning place of that little assembly there in Philippi. We'll, we'll read more about that. So we had so far, uh, follow-up is produces growth, family focus produces growth, Growth, evangelism produces growth, and hospitality produces growth. Individual growth and assembly growth. And then we go on about uh, Paul and Silas's experience here. It's a little bit long, but I'd like to read through it. Continuing chapter 16, verse 16. It says, now it happened. Now it says we. So uh, apparently Luke is with them now, the author of the uh, book of Acts. Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed, possessed with, with a spirit of divination met us, who brought her masters much profit by fortune-telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to us the way of salvation. Now, she, she's not of the Lord, but somehow this spirit, not a good spirit, but it's telling it's announcing this, and Paul gets a little annoyed by it. Uh, she, he didn't want uh, a demon voice being his uh, spokesperson. Verse 18, and this she did for many days, but Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, 
I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. But when her master, this, this woman's masters, saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. And they brought them to the magistrates and said, these men being Jews exceedingly trouble our city. And they teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive or observe. So the Romans said, you have to just worship the emperor. And now Paul is telling them uh, about worshiping one God. Right? So verse 22, then the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. So how depressed they must have been after all that, right? <laughs> how depressed. <clears throat> but we read in chapter 16, verse 25, but at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening. Mm -hmm. And so our point here is uh, praying and singing through life's trials produces growth. Used to be a brother here named John Michon. And wherever I heard him, he was singing. He was humming a hymn. I remember him telling us he was at work and he's singing, going up in the elevator. And some coworkers are like, what are you singing about? But uh, always had a song. It's, it's good. So here's Paul and Silas, and they're in this jail. They've been seized. They've been dragged. Their, their clothes are torn off them. They've been beaten with rods. There's many stripes. They're in the inner prison, feet in stocks. And it's midnight, and they're praying and singing hymns to God. They're worshiping God. So the idea of praying and worshiping, and it has a, such an important effect on us, but, but it advances the gospel. I always appreciated going to uh, Sister Colleen's house, Colleen Citarella, used her, using her bathroom, and, and on the mirror there she had a prayer list of all the people she's praying for. And she was an effective evangelist. Uh, praying and singing. So uh, Ephesians 6.18 says, uh, praying always. Uh, in the Darby translation, it says, that means praying at all seasons, in, in the good seasons and the bad seasons, praying. Colossians 3.16 tells us we are to be teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. This is something... I need to do all these points today are, are lessons for me, uh, lessons I need to uh, keep at, renew and expand in, to, to sing to the Lord. So I wonder, maybe you could tell me, did Paul and Silas have the red book or the black book? Which, which, which was it? <laughs> we, we have a, a vote on that. So do we know hymns? Can we, can we sing them ourselves? Uh, at the bottom here, uh, I have a note. Uh, well, at the bottom, at the very bottom, is a song that my daughter sings to her children every time she puts them to bed. Uh, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. They sang that at uh, Eva's uh, Christian preschool, and she says, can we sing the second verse? The teacher's like, What? <laughs> Jesus loves me, he who died. Heaven's gate to open wide. He will wash away my sin. Let his little child come in. And so as it says above it there, it is no exaggeration to say that songs have taught more theology to new converts than textbooks. That's from the Wycliffe commentary. So praying and singing through life's trials produces growth. So we see the growth here. Uh, Acts 16, we continue on, verse 26. So after this, they're singing, suddenly it was a great earthquake. Now, I don't know if the earthquake is because of their prayers or that was just something that happened all the time in Philip. Is that common in, in that part of Greece, brother? You think? Earthquakes? Yeah? Okay. Uh, Albania is right on top of Greece there. So they know the territory. And in fact, Paul uh, mentions that he visits Albania. They call it Illyricum. But... Anyway, suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. 
And the keeper of the prison, awaking from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. Now think of this. He figures he, he's going to be judged for losing his prisoners. So he decides to take his life. But he's going from one judgment of his superiors to judgment before God if he does that. So Paul called out with a loud voice saying, do yourself no harm, for we are all here. Then he, that the jailer, called for a light, ran in and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. This man is, is uh, deeply impressed with, with Paul and Silas. We're told that salvation requires uh, re repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. It, it requires repentance. In other words, acknowledging our, our sinful state, really realizing our unworthiness. This man is realizing this, so Paul doesn't even have to mention repentance. <laughs> uh, he, he brings Paul and Silas out. He brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. So simple gospel. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. So they, he, he brings them to their house and he gets, Paul and Silas gets to share the gospel with all his family. You know, sometimes we think uh, we, it's too much to explain to somebody, but here's just one, two, three, four, five, six words. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody asks you, what, what is Christianity about? Just Believe, trust in the Lord Jesus. In other words, and you have to explain a little bit more, trust that his death on the cross was for your benefit. God, put your sins upon him. And through that faith, you are saved through trusting in him. It's, it's not that complicated. Sometimes my, my uh, mind, my, my fears tell me it's too much to explain to somebody. So I, I back off, but it's not. It's a simple gospel. So they they tell his whole family. So it wasn't, it wasn't, it's not like I don't get from this that they're babies there because uh they explained the word to all who were in the house. And let and lastly, number seven, uh baptizing and bringing it to fellowship produces growth. Continue on in the verses. Verse 33, the jailer, it says, and he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. Now, here's a man who was, you know, maybe had beaten them, put them in the stocks. Now he's he's washing their stripes, their, their, their wounds. They had stripes. Think about that. They had stripes. And immediately he and all his family were baptized. Now, when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them, and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all his household. Every time we read Luke talking about somebody being saved, especially in his, in his gospel, we always read about the joy going with that. He rejoiced with all his household. I remember Lydia's household had been baptized also, it didn't explain that they all heard and believed, but we can imply from, from this that they all had heard the gospel and all had believed as well. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been baptized. And then lastly, verse 16, verse 40. So Paul and Silas, they, they, they get out of jail. Just give you a little shortcut here. They get out of jail and says, so they went out of the prison and entered the house. They were, they were got out. But the rulers said, can you please leave town? <laughs> so they're, they're, gonna, they're on their way out of town. They don't want to cause any trouble for the assembly that was started now. <laughs> so they went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia. And when they had seen the brethren, they encouraged them and departed. So here's a little nucleus of believers that has started. And it's in this, this sister's house. Not just her, but there's, there's other saints there. And so they encouraged them and departed. But now think about it. That's not the end of it. Paul writes to them later. He sends others to visit them. So 
this this is our list, right? <laughs> Seven keys to church growth. So which of these things uh, can I do to help someone? <laughs> Follow up, uh, family focus, uh, spirit-led evangelism, uh, hospitality, uh, praying and singing, explaining the pure, simple gospel, or encouraging someone to be baptized and to come into fellowship. Which of these things can I do? So the gospel went on, here we had it, to uh, the left here in, uh, in uh, oh, actually down here, sorry. They left here in uh, Antioch, and they traveled through, picked up Timothy, went through Turkey, and they came over here to uh, Philippi in, in Europe. So here's the start of the gospel, first century. But as I said, it continued on, and the Romans, Roman army uh, ruled. They ruled all of Europe, almost all of Europe. And there was peace there, so they, they, the gospel could travel. That was the amazing thing about that time in history. But one place it didn't get to was Ireland. The Romans never never conquered Ireland. Maybe they didn't, maybe they weren't interested. But um, they said there was nothing. There was no mines there that they were interested as far as getting lead or tin out of any mines there. So they never went to Ireland. But but the Romans protected. Uh, this is Britain here. This island is Britain, made up of uh, England and this little part is Wales and Scotland. Okay, there are Scotland. If you're part of Britain, okay. so this is Scotland. Nowadays they call the north of Ireland. Uh, Part of what they call the, the United Kingdom, but it's it's on a, it's on the island of Ireland. So the church prospered here in in uh, Roman Britain, and um, there's this fellow who, when he was 16 years of age, he was he was born to a uh, his father was a was a deacon. His grandfather was they call a presbyter. Some translations say priest, but he's a presbyter. And so this fellow, he's 16 years of age, and, and the Roman army had been protecting this area, but the Germans started attacking, German tribes started attacking Rome, and so all these troops have to withdraw. And all of a sudden, Britain is not protected. And so the 16-year-old fellow, uh, living some price near the coast here, maybe Wales, maybe Northern England, uh, one day, a bunch of pirates come from Ireland, and there's nobody to protect them. And they take him and, and hundreds, maybe thousands, and they bring him as prisoners to Ireland. He's 16 years of age. And so he gets to Ireland and he's made to, to herd sheep for six years. And you know what he says? Uh, he began to pray and call out to God and acknowledge his sins. He wasn't interested in the gospel as a boy. In fact, later in life, he tells his testimony, which is what you have in that paper there, his confession, about some terrible sin that he had done in his youth that he didn't want anybody to know about. So he gets there, and he's, he's, he's in, the, uh, in the fields day and night. They think he's probably over in the western coast. His name's Patrick, by the way. He's over in the western coast of, of Ireland, it seems, and herding these sheep for six years. And he says he just he would pray day and night and call out to the Lord, and his faith grew. And so finally, one night, he has a dream. And in the dream, he's told, your, your ship is waiting. You can, you can leave now. And so he's been there six years. He runs away, and he finds his way to the coast, and he, he catches a boat there. They almost don't take him, but then he prays, and they take him. He gets on a boat, and it brings him back. And eventually, somehow, he gets back to his home. And his parents say, don't ever leave us again. <laughs> but he has a dream again. <laughs> and in the dream, he dreams that uh, somebody comes to him with a sack of mail, and they're all letters from people in Ireland. And in the letters, it says, uh, holy boy, come and walk among us. Come and walk among us. <laughs> so Patrick uh, leaves, and he goes back. He's, he's named a bishop in Ireland, and he goes there, and thousands of people are, are saved, baptized, brought into the church, and he's, he's beaten, he's, it's, he's put in prisons, and his life is in danger all the time, but 
as you read his story, it, it's so filled with scripture. But the point is his, his dedication and what Cap Patrick felt. So now it's in about 400, mid 400s. And Patrick said, if you look at the, the longitudinal lines here, Ireland is the furthest most part, furthest uh, western part. Patrick believed that he was at the end of the world and that God would come now, the Lord would come now because the gospel had come to Ireland. And that was his, his passion for it because now the gospel had come. So he didn't know about other people who were living across, across the waves here. <laughs> he didn't know about... Uh, uh, that's the... He didn't know about people, for instance, over in, in Central America, maybe Patricia's relatives and all that hadn't heard yet. So, so the Lord wasn't going to come just yet. But that was Patrick's vision. So I just pray that we have a desire to uh, see growth in our friends and in, in, the, in the assembly and in, in the church by, by follow up, by focus on the family, evangelism, hospitality, uh, praying, uh, singing, explaining the gospel, encouraging people to be baptized and continuing to follow up. So may God bless the reading of his word. Thank you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, for all that you're doing. Thank you for this beautiful day, Father. Help us to be strong in our faith. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.